Welcome to Strange Reads. I'm David in The Signal Box, and today we're doing The Signalman by Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens may be one of the most recognisable author names in history. And for that honour, I used his name interchangeably with Charles Darwin for most of my primary school years, and for probably many outtakes from this footage. Right? Charles John Huffam Dickens was born 7th February 1812 at One Mile End Terrace, Landport, Hampshire. He was the second of seven children to parents Elizabeth and John Dickens. The family moved several times before settling in Chatham, Kent, where he spent an idyllic childhood until the age of 11. This was when his father was forced into Marshall C. Debtor's prison by creditors in 1824. Charles boarded with Elizabeth Roylands at 112 College Place in Camden Town. During this time, he worked at Warren's Blacking Factory. Charles left employment to gain an education at Wellington House Academy until 1827. When he left school, he became a clerk at Ellison Blackmore Solicitors. Following this, he started his literary career as a freelance reporter. His first published story, A Dinner at Poplar Walk, featured in the Monthly magazine. By 1836, the Pickwick Papers started serialisation. He married Catherine Hogarth on the 2nd of April 1836, and soon after, Charles begins a serialised account of Oliver Twist in Bentley's Miscellany. Charles and Catherine welcomed their first of ten children on the 6th of January 1837. Over the next five years, Charles published memoirs of Joseph Grimaldi, Nicholas Nickleby, The Old Curiosity Shop, and A Christmas Carol first appeared on the 19th of December, 1843. Just in time for Santa. In 1857, Charles, now 45, meets actress Ellen Ternan, who was 18. He separates from Catherine, stating that she was mentally unbalanced. Rumours suggest Ellen and Dickens move in together. While returning from Paris on the 9th of June 1865, Charles survived the Staplehurst rail crash. We'll touch more on this later in our story inspiration section. Over the next few years, he writes A Tale of Two Cities and Great Expectations. His last complete novel, Our Mutual Friend, is published in 1864, while the mystery of Edwin Drood remained unfinished. On the 9th of June 1870, Charles suffered a stroke at Gads Hill. Reportedly, his last words were, on the ground, said to his sister-in-law, Georgina, following her request that he lie down. His final resting place is at Poets' Corner, Westminster Abbey in England. The signal one can be read online for free. There's also a lovely version of it by the BBC available on YouTube. I'll put the links in the description below. We're gonna walk down the steep embankments into the story now, so beware, spoilers ahead. Hello! Below there! Charles Dickens's The Signalman begins with this cry from our narrator. The man whom he calls out to, a signal box controller, responds in an unconventional manner. Instead of turning to where the narrator stood, the signalman peers down the railway line. The narrator repeats his greeting. Hello! Below there! After a steam train rushes past, the signalman turns toward his visitor, still somewhat hesitant in his demeanour. Eventually, he motions toward a zigzag descending path. The signalman's post was a solitary and dismal place. On either side of the deep cutting, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of sky, reminiscent of a deep dungeon. There is a gloomy red light over a gloomier entrance to a black tunnel. It had an earthly deadly smell, and so much cold wind rushed through it that it struck chill to me, as if I had left the natural world. The signalman presents as a spirit, not a man. Later, the narrator speculates whether he may have had an infection of the mind. The man held some latent fear of me. Not stirring until his visitor was near enough to touch him, the signalman slowly became responsive to his visitor's questions. The man described having several duties concerning the management of the line. He found time to study algebra and a language in quiet spells, yet remained limited at both. The two men walk to the signal box. There is a fire, a desk, an electric bell, and telegraphic instruments. The conversation is sometimes interrupted by the bell. In response, the signalman appeared exact and vigilant in his duties, displaying a flag or exchanging verbal communication with the train driver. This proficiency is only marred by him twice breaking off a conversation to face the bell when it didn't ring, then move to the door and look toward the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. 
The narrator moves to leave, describing the signalman as content. The railway employee replies, But I am troubled, sir. I am troubled. Unable or unwilling to describe why he is troubled, the two men agree to meet a second time, at eleven the following night. Before bidding his visitor farewell, the signalman asks, What made you cry, hello, below there tonight? The narrator can't say why. Here the signalman asks if there might have been some supernatural motivation to choose those words, to which the narrator still has no answer. The narrator returns to a nearby pub where he has accommodation. The next night, the signalman begins describing his troubles. He says that he initially mistook the visitor for someone else. Someone he'd seen one moonlit night. A person standing by the red light, shouting, Hello, below there, with his left arm across his face and waving his right arm. When the signalman approached the stranger, he disappeared. The narrator tries to ease the signalman's nerves by explaining the sighting as a trick of the light and wind. The signalman dismisses this rationale and continues, A terrible accident occurred on the line within six hours of this appearance. The dead and injured were brought to the exact spot where the stranger had stood. All this happened a year ago, and then, before seven months passed, he saw the spectre again, standing by the red light. This time it covered its face as if in mourning. Later that day, he stopped a passing train upon seeing a confusion of hands and heads in a carriage. A beautiful young lady had died instantaneously in one of the compartments and was brought in here and laid down on this floor between us. The signalman resumed his story, announcing the spectre had returned a week ago. I have no peace or rest for it. It calls to me in an agonized manner. Below there, look out, look out. And ringing the bell in his cabin, the narrator asks, did it ring your bell yesterday evening when I was here? And you went to the door, to which the signalman answers, twice. The signalman is consumed with dread, asking, what does it warn me against? The responsibility of these cautions also weighs heavily upon him. Finally, the narrator leaves at 2 a.m. as the demands of the signalman's job occupy his attention. The following day, a narrator considers how to act in response to the man's disclosure. He decides to offer to accompany him to see the wisest medical practitioner and take an opinion. By evening, he went out to enjoy a walk not intending to go straight to visit the signalman. However, on passing the brink of the cutting, he looked down at the mouth of the tunnel and saw a man, with his left sleeve across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm. A small hut built out of supports and tarpaulin had been constructed near this figure. Our narrator approaches at once and is told that the signalman had been killed this morning, cut down by an engine on the line, and now lies beneath the tarpaulin. In the accident, as the train approached, the signalman had paid no heed to the whistle, so the engine driver called out to him. What did you say? asked the narrator. I said, Below there! Look out! Look out! For God's sake, clear the way! The signalman is a tale of two cities, Clayton in West Sussex and Staplehurst in Kent. Public transport can be rough, but in Charles Dickens' day, he would have just been happy for the train to stay on the tracks. It is believed that the Clayton Tunnel Rail Crash was the principal inspiration for Dickens when riding the signalman. On Sunday the 25th of August 1861, five miles from Brighton, on the south coast of England, a train collided with another inside Clayton Tunnel. 23 people were killed and 176 others were injured. At the time, the accident was the worst in British railway history. Confusion with flag signals and a malfunction in an automatic signaler were cited as causes for the collision. Another factor contributing to this accident involved Sigelman Killick working a continuous 24-hour shift. To gain a full day off duty, the Sigelman chose to extend his regulation 18-hour day. In Captain Tyler's report, he wrote, It was disgraceful that a man in so responsible a position as Sigelman Killick should be compelled to work for 24 hours at a stretch in order to earn one day of rest a week. The moral theme in the signalman is responsibility. The signalman is haunted not only by the spirit at the tunnel mouth, but also by his duty to protect train passengers, conductors, and other crewmen on his line. On the 9th of June, 1865, at 3.13 p.m., the Stablehurst rail crash occurred, involving the derailment of a train near Stablehurst in Kent. The South Eastern Railway, Folkestone to London boat train, derailed while crossing a viaduct. Engineering works had removed a section of the track. The accident killed 10 passengers and injured 40. Traveling aboard this train, the Charles Dickens, 
Ellen Ternan, and her mother. They all survived the derailment. However, he tended the victims, some of whom died before him. The experience affected Dickens greatly, and he lost his voice for two weeks. For the rest of his life, Dickens would be nervous when traveling by train. He died five years to the day after the accident. His son stated that the author had never fully recovered. The Signalman was first published as number one branch line, The Signalman, in the Mugby Junction collection of the 1866 Christmas edition of All the Year Round. As you can see, it appears to be part of a set of stories by a variety of authors included in this publication. Thanks for watching. What do you think the protagonist was seeing in Charles Dickens' The Signalman? Get in touch via the comments with any speculative fiction that you think would make a great Strange Roots episode. And discover other literary gems in one of our other Strange Roots episodes. For everything else, our social media links are on screen. And remember, keep it strange. Thank you.